Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Sullivan, and we are back together for another Eye Care for Your Brain lecture. This one is really special for me tonight. I think if you've been following me by now, I hope that you realize that this is so much more than a job for me, so much more than an academic interest. I really try to be bring my very best self and my heart and soul into this work. And it's really based in my experiences caring for people with dementia. The way that this whole interest in the brain and people in that intersection came about was from my grandmother's experience with Alzheimer's disease. And from there, I went on to be a caregiver for about six or seven years before I went to graduate school. And so I feel like I care and know about this stuff, not just from books and from the excellent training that I've been so lucky to have, but also from living in homes with people and really having my heart involved in their care. In addition to being a neuropsychologist in my practice here in North Carolina, where me and my colleagues do assessments and help people get correct diagnoses, I really also have another mission in my work, which is to spread awareness about the experience of people living with dementia and to really try to uh, contribute to a positive change in my community and the broader society to make people with dementia less ignored and more included. And that really is a layer of disability in dementia. Of course, it is a progressive neurodegenerative condition. Uh, people have significant cognitive changes. There are difficulties maintaining independence in everyday life. There are mood and behavior changes many times, but there also is a social piece and that is something that we can control. And it really does contribute to the poor quality of life that many people with dementia unfortunately have and this is because they are not talked to as much they get less eye contact than other older adults their same age there's something that happens to the listener when they're not educated or they don't understand the exact skills they don't understand how to respond to someone with dementia where it just it just becomes uh something that happens where people just aren't included in conversation. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about tonight is kind of the, the dangers that go along with being diagnosed with dementia outside what you normally might think of. So uh, I was reflecting on this talk to myself last night and I was just thinking how touched and how shaped my life has been by people living with dementia. And I just thought I would share a quick little personal story with you all. So um, right before I was born and raised in New Jersey, and then I moved to Boston when I was 19. And right before I left, I was taking care of a man named Frank. And Frank unfortunately had had a couple of strokes and we had a really sweet relationship. We would go out and get grilled cheese together most every day that I was with him. And, and he had a wonderful family and we, were, we had a really sweet relationship. And so when I moved to Boston, I was 19. I didn't have much money. I was really struggling. Right before I moved, he passed away. And when I got to Boston, you know, I was trying to put all my pennies together to make sure that I would be able to survive. And one day in the mail, I got a card from his daughter and inside was Frank's tax return. And it was for about $600, which was a really big deal to me at the time. And she had written it over to me and it was so touching and it literally helped me survive when I first uh, was out on my own. So I, I have so many stories like that of, um, and, and that's really the beautiful thing that happens when you connect with people with dementia. It's not just caregiving, you often get as much as you give. Um, so, you know, it's very important as we start these conversations about dementia just to kind of go through the basics in case someone is listening to us that um, might not have a, a good understanding. So dementia is not a normal part of aging. It is caused by different diseases in the brain. Um, and what you have to have is three criteria to have the diagnosis. One is your cognitive abilities have to decline from where they were previously. And this has to be in two areas. So typically memory, plus word finding, memory, plus visuospatial abilities, your ability to kind of spatially navigate, you know, uh, parallel park the car, you know, these kind of things, or, you know, pay attention, um, 
our ability to problem solve, multitask, things like this. But you also have to have changes in your everyday functioning, meaning you need help. You're not able to be as independent with things like driving, remembering to take your medications, and managing complex finances. Often, many times, people also have mood and behavior changes, and we think sometimes, especially with Alzheimer's, that maybe these are the very first symptoms that happen even a few years before the cognitive change. And this is typically uh, a set of symptoms that can actually look like depression, but it's a loss of interest, a loss of initiative, someone just doesn't seem to care as much, maybe a little bit more grumpy, a little bit more irritable. And that's related to not only the brain changes, the very first ones that are happening, but also maybe some early awareness about what is changing and how things are harder. So things are um, more difficult for the person. So I want you to know dementia is a syndrome. It's not just a memory problem. Um, we have risk factors for dementia that are what we call modifiable and non-modifiable. So meaning things you can change and things you can't change. The things you can't change that put you at risk for dementia are getting older. It's the number one risk factor for dementia. But remember, it does not mean that as you age, you will inevitably get dementia. Okay, that's, that's a stereotype. We also have specific genetic mutations that make us um, significantly at risk for dementia. Typically, the younger you are when you get dementia, the more genetic it is. But for the vast majority of us, we have what we call modifiable risk factors, where we have a family history, a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, and uncle who developed dementia in their later years. But something in our life, something in our environment turns on those genes. And that's really what scientists are trying to go after is what is it specifically, if two people have the same genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's, what is it that makes one get it and one doesn't? So we have some really good clues. Uh, we know that vascular health plays a big role in this. So this is the circulation throughout our body and things like high blood pressure, untreated sleep apnea, type two diabetes, high cholesterol is a little bit more controversial, but typically things that impede good healthy blood flow into our brain are definitely risk factors. We also have things like not enough exercise, a poor diet where someone has a lot of inflammation in their body, um, too much alcohol, not enough stimulation, depression. There's many, many different things that have been identified. All dementias are progressive, unfortunately. There's a difference whether or not they start rapidly or they start very slowly. But unfortunately, over time, we either have a slow and steady decline or we have what we call a stepwise decline, which is kind of like a set of stairs where someone seems to take a dip, then they level off, then another little dip. It's important to know that not all memory symptoms are caused by dementia. A lot of people are nervous about coming in for an evaluation and that's understandable, but the way I think about it is it's either happening or not, whether we give it a name. And you know, if, if things go well and you uh, are having real problems, they could be caused by something treatable, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, medications, like I said before, alcohol, untreated sleep apnea, low vitamin B, thyroid issues, chronic pain, urinary tract infections. There's many, many things. And that's part of what a neuropsychologist does is they separate causes and effects. So they are really, really good. We are the experts in figuring out brain and behavior. Why is it important to get an early and accurate diagnosis? Well, let's go through the state of affairs as it is now. 50 to 65% of people diagnosed with dementia have no record of it in their medical record, no documentation. And I ask you, what other medical condition would that be okay? If you had breast cancer and you went and got your medical records and there was a 50 to 65% chance that it would not be listed in your medical records, I'm pretty sure you would not be happy about that, right? If you ask caregivers how long it took them from the time they voiced their initial concerns to physicians to the point of getting an actual diagnosis, on average, research tells us it is over two years. Those two years, I can assure you, are filled with uncertainty, anxiety, way more stress and strain that really needs to be there. This is in contrast though to 92% of Americans that say, I want the proper workup for dementia. I want to know if something like this is happening. If we don't recognize a dementia that is genuinely starting, not only are we gonna have more symptoms in all of those domains I told you about, because often there's other contributing factors on top of the dementia that make it worse. Very, very few people, if any, 
come to me with one specific cause for cognitive impairment. It's almost always a little bit of like a layered cake. And the symptoms underneath depend on how many layers we have. So if we can take away some of those layers, we can improve quality of life, independence, uh, prognosis. There's so much that we can do. We can't think of dementia just as this hopeless uh, medical diagnosis. And we also know that this jacks up the cost of healthcare, which we're all suffering from. More of these people are going to the emergency room because no one has helped them understand their symptoms. Their caregivers are completely exhausted. They have no direction. They have no support. Valuable time is lost when we do not diagnose dementia early or accurately. The way the medications on the market work now is that the earlier you start to take them, they slow down symptoms at that time. That's a talk in and of itself, the way the medications work. They don't actually seem to affect the actual disease process that's happening in the brain. But what we see is a slowing of the symptoms, the way that they express themselves in real life, which is what we really care about, right? As I said before, we're losing time to treat modifiable risk factors that may be contributing to the, the dementia. We lose time to connect people to community resources. If you're lucky, you might be living in an area that has an awesome support group, a, something called a memory cafe that I'm gonna tell you about today, an adult day health program, social work, geriatric caregivers. There is a community of us out here who support people living with dementia, caring for people with dementia, but oftentimes it's just a disconnect of, of getting together with those people. You also lose a chance to make informed decisions about the future. Many people want to say what happens to them in the future. And when there's a cognitive impairment that's getting worse and worse, one of the things that happens is our decision-making abilities can suffer. Not always, just because you have dementia doesn't mean you are incompetent by any stretch of the imagination. But many times people want to say early on, this is my end of life plan. This is what I want to happen to my assets that I work so hard for. I worry also if we're not diagnosing people early that we are missing an opportunity to reduce the risk of exploitation. There's a lot of people out there, terrible people, that prey not only on older adults, but really prey on people with cognitive impairment. I hear about scams all the time in my community from people that come to the door promising to put a new roof on, to you know who have no skills or ability and need a deposit, to uh, scams that happen on the telephone. I mean, it's just on and on. So the question is, what are the barriers? Why is it taking so long for people to get correctly diagnosed? Well, there's still a lot of stereotypes about dementia. There are doubts about what, what good is it gonna do, okay? Why would we, a lot of doctors I've heard, you know, really uh, poo-poo the medications that are out there. Ah, those aren't going to work. Well, guess what? If that's all we have and it's going to do something, let's actually give it a chance and see. It, it, medications have varying successes depending on all sorts of things related to people's physiology, related to the specific disease issues that are happening in their brain, related to their expectancy. What do they think is going to happen? This is where we get into the placebo effect and the nocebo effect. If people think they're taking a pill every day, oh, this is, you know, people do this with antidepressants all the time. Oh, there's my crazy pill. Oh, that's going to help that will have an impact on what happens in your body and in your behavior based on the cognitive set, the expectations that you have going into that time of taking your medication. This one really gets me, it's a huge pet peeve of mine, that there is this awful tendency to downplay the concerns of older adults as it comes to memory. Ah, you're 75 years old, you know, what do you expect? This is what happens. I had a patient in here the other day who's 91 and he said every time he brings up uh, concerns related to his brain to his doctor, the doctor just repeats the year he was born, you know, whatever that was, 1929. Hey, 1929, 1929, as if that that's just a blanket explanation for everything that could be happening and there's no pursuit of a more comprehensive workup. There's no maybe trying to connect him with a neuropsychologist, somebody that really has the expertise to say, is this normal aging or is it something that we want to be proactive about? There's also this lack of time that I always talk about that's happening. It's really a public health crisis, particularly in primary care. These poor people who've trained so hard they typically, I find, have huge hearts and really want to help people. 
the way hospital administrations have to work these days because the rising costs and all sorts of other issues is they are on a volume program. They have to see so many people day in and day out that I worry that we're losing the quality, the connection, the comprehensive care that people really deserve. There's also a lack of knowledge about local dementia experts. I've been in my practice for five years. My practice is the only practice for a good many miles that has neuropsychology. I still meet people in my little town that have never heard of us here. And we go out and we're talking all the time and many people have been kind to talk about us to friends and family and there's still people that you just never know if they realize that you're here. And the last one is stigma and this really gets us into our topic tonight. There is so much social stigma about dementia. There was a study in AARP a couple years ago that asked older folks, what do you fear most as you get older in terms of medical conditions? 1% said diabetes, 4% said heart disease, 10% said cancer, and over 70% said dementia. There are so many stereotypes about dementia. I just wanted to pull some from the research to give you a flavor. 62% of older adults that were polled in this one study said that they felt that if they were told they had dementia, it would mean that their life was over. Okay, one in four people thought if they got this diagnosis, they would instantly have to stop going out for a walk on their own. 50% of people thought they would have to immediately stop driving. But the biggest fear that people had was that other people would think that they were crazy. 70% of people said, I don't think I would be the same person if I was diagnosed with dementia. That is so sad, that is so inaccurate, and that is so ignorant, really. Many, many people with dementia talk to me, talk to other professionals about their fear of being ignored and not included. When I was getting my bachelor's degree, my honors thesis was about the subjective experience of dementia, and I had a focus group with, I think, about nine folks with Alzheimer's disease. And they told me that their number one uh, area of hurt feelings was at meals that they would be ignored or people would be talking too fast and they just felt very separate and very isolated. Uh, more than half of people with dementia in other studies say that they feel dismissed. Other people avoid spending time with them. 40% of people said that their invitations have decreased, Christmas cards decrease. Um, one in four people with this diagnosis hide it from other people and when you ask them why, they say it's because people are not going to care about me in the same way. Other research has suggested that stigma about dementia actually causes more anxiety in these people than any stage of the disease or any memory symptoms, okay? So why is this so damaging when we are ignored? It is because we are wired for social connection. We are the social animal. We have parts of our brain that the only reason they are there, the only reason that they have evolved is to help us interact more successfully with other people. We have a place in the brain called the fusiform gyrus. Its only job is to perceive human faces and the nuances of human emotion. We have many different types of neurons in our brain, brain cells. One of them are called mirror neurons. And the only reason that they are there is to help us observe people's body language, how they go about learning new skills so that we can flip it on ourselves and kind of absorb those things, learn from watching social learning, okay? So what the heck is going on here? Why is it that we have so much social stigma? Well, for me, I think it comes down to four main reasons. I would love to hear if you guys have ideas on this as well. I think part of it is just a general lack of knowledge. 93% um, of older adults in one study said that they were aware of Alzheimer's disease, they heard the term, but about three quarters of these people said they actually knew very little or nothing about the disease. The number one question I get as a neuropsychologist is what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? If I have Alzheimer's, 
Do I have dementia? If someone has dementia, do they have Alzheimer's? That's a very basic question. And what I'll say is dementia is the umbrella term and there's many different types, subtypes of dementia. If you have dementia, you don't necessarily have Alzheimer's, okay? Alzheimer's is one of those subtypes, a, process, a disease process that happens in the brain. So if you have Alzheimer's, you do have dementia, okay? Uh, a 2009 survey found that one third of the population thinks that dementia is a natural part of aging and a quarter of people think that there's absolutely nothing that you can do to decrease your risk. And this goes along with the whole, well, you know, why refer someone to a specialist? Why try the medications? The kind of this hopeless, there's nothing that you can do about it feeling. So lack of knowledge is one. Number two, I think that there is a general lack of skill. I believe in the good heartedness of the vast majority of people, but I think people don't know what to do. They freeze when somebody tells them the same story five times. They are not skilled in, in how to include people and it's just the path of least resistance to focus all the attention on the intact spouse. Research has shown that even hospital staff and caregivers don't really have the skills needed to optimally communicate. And everything, not everything, the majority of things that people learn is through their own trial and error. And that bothers me because the, the slope of caregiving and dementia is already very steep. Do we need anything at all that adds to the stress that adds to the heartbreak that adds to the journey we really don't so we have to find a way to more systematically give people the skills train people in what to do the other thing of course is culturally constructed what is our definition of personhood now i'm here in north carolina I'm an American, this is the lens that I have through the world. And I can tell you that in this culture, our Western culture, that we have a very strong premium on intellect and accomplishments and education and what you do and what you produce. And we've even been called a hypercognitive society, that this matters above and beyond anything else. And what happens when you lose that? Do you, is that part of the losing of our value as people? That you know, when we can't find our words, when we are showing that we have lost some of our cognitive ability, does that mean we've lost our humanity? That we've lost our personhood? Of course, those of us that are in this field and that are out there loving somebody with dementia know that that's ridiculous. But we have to understand what the limitations are if we're gonna do any successful interventions to turn this around. The other thing, of course, the fourth contributor we can never forget is that we live in a very ageist society. You can ask yourself, do we value youthfulness over uh, the wisdom of getting older? Um, I can drive down my main street here in my town and see about three medical spas that focus on Botox and fillers. And um, you know, I'm not gonna lie, I put on a little moisturizer this morning. Um, there is a lot of messages that we get over and over and over again, subtle and, and hit over the head, that being young is where it's at, right? Think about people with dementia, they're kind of hit twice. They get the impact of the ageism, but they also get the impact of being someone who's cognitively impaired. So in the mid to late 1990s, there was this awesome psychologist in England named Dr. Thomas Kitwood, and he started this movement called person-centered care. And this is founded on the ethic that human beings are all human beings, whether or not they're cognitively intact or not, are of absolute value and uh, the conviction that people with dementia can live meaningful lives if their environment and their social world was just more supported. So he's really the, the guy that came up with this idea that the experience, the disability, the pain of dementia not only comes from the biology but also these social factors. And so the question that I really have to ask you tonight is what is our responsibility to do better? Okay, this is a talk that I actually go out and give in churches in my community because I really think that if you are a person of faith, 
that there is a responsibility for you to live your faith truly, to be more aware of the needs of these people in your community, and to be uh, have more of a commitment to connecting. So what I wanna do tonight is talk about what is our personal responsibility, what are our social community responsibilities, and what really are our spiritual responsibilities? So my first question is, well, what can you do as a person? Well, the most basic thing that you can do is look around in your community, open your eyes, and see who are the people that are maybe having some symptoms of dementia. You might know this from the grapevine, you might know this from talking with them, they seem to be repeating, you might know this from a friend, but you just wanna be more cognizant, commit yourself to connecting. It's really very simple. And so what we wanna do is, is remember that many people with dementia are having particular trouble with language. So we don't want to bombard people with a lot of words. And this is more for after people are through the mild stage. So I'm talking a little bit more about moderate now. You really want to think about your body language. So when people are having trouble with words, you have to really make sure that your face is nice and wide and open, that your hands are open, that you're using touch. You wanna approach the person from the front. Hi, my name is Karen. You might remember we met a couple weeks ago um, at you know Hope Church down the street. And you want to kind of give the person the benefit of the doubt so they're not scrambling in their head, oh gosh, you know, I don't know this person's name. You kind of provide that information for them. You want to use their name a lot. People remember their name. That is one of the very, very, very final things. You want to get their full attention. Eye contact is key. Getting down on someone's level. Really being mindful of body language. You want to try to speak a little bit more clearly, loudly and slowly, giving the person time to process and respond using shorter sentences. We do this thing where we sometimes add in three or four questions in one statement. You really just need to slow down and focus on asking one thing at a time. You want to be a very good listener. You have to look for all signs of communication, not just words. This is where you're going to be receptive of their body language. What exactly is it that they're trying to express? One thing that people often ask me is if someone says something that's incorrect or you know they think that I am uh, their sister that they haven't seen in a long time, what should I say? I really don't think there's a need to correct people, okay? We're not the memory police. Unless the person is in danger, I think the most important thing is that you're trying to resonate with the emotion that is coming out and connect. Once. In a few slides, I'm gonna to get to talking about these behavior symptoms and why it's just so important to be observant, to validate the emotion underneath, and then really distract the person if there's some distress that's going on. You, uh, even if you think the person might not remember you, that's not an excuse not to try to connect with them, okay? Even if they don't remember you and your friendship from the past, they are still human beings that have a very strong need to connect with people, right? With their community. So if they don't remember you, that that's really fine. Being very genuine and asking the person how they're doing, connecting with the caregiver. Caregivers are a whole nother talk. They suffer from a lot of these same social isolation symptoms as well. What really matters is your sincere interest, okay? There's going to be good days in dementia. There's going to be bad days. Your job is not to cheer people up. It's not to put a positive spin on it. It is simply to be present. If you really believe that your presence is the present, you will do very, very well, okay? If you decide that you want to offer some type of support or respite to someone with dementia or their caregiver, I beg you to please be reliable. Please don't say, I would love to come over this weekend and maybe take Joe out and we can go you know, shoot a couple uh, golf balls on the golf course um, and not show up. That's very stressful. That caregiver was counting on it. That person might not remember, but very important that you fulfill your commitments to people, okay? 
Um, I was talking a little bit before about some of the so-called behavior problems that happen in dementia. Luckily, our culture is more progressive now and many people in elder care do understand that if someone seems to be uh, having a hard day or they are agitated or they are, you know, um, doing something harmful to themselves or someone else that, you know, they don't have the words. We have to look underneath. Is the person in pain? Um, you know, I mean, I've heard stories from, you know, a piece of hair was wrapped around someone's big toe and it was cutting off their circulation urinary tract infections, they're wet, they're bored. There's all sorts of things that we have to be observant about, right? And not just medicate these people, not just pharmacologically restrain these people so that they're quiet and they're easier to care for. So remember, you wanna be observant, you wanna validate the emotion underneath and distracting is a way to kind of use the dementia to our benefit, right? It's some people, you know, uh, let's just say there's some um, sundowning going on and the person is fixated on the fact that they shouldn't be here, they need to get home to their, their family, they need to be somewhere. Sometimes people who just don't know any better will get into that conversation over and over and try to explain them, rationally explain why this isn't the case and this is where you live now. Because the short-term memory system is not working, because new learning is not happening, you're just digging that person deeper into a distress hole. I want you to validate that emotion. You, know, you could say something like, oh, it must be very stressful to feel like you're not in the right place, but you're here, this is where you're supposed to be, you're safe, I'm with you. Let's go over here and see what Judy's doing. Maybe we could help um, fold some of those towels over there, okay? And that's where the, the physical touch comes in, that feeling of connection. What those people are telling us is that they're afraid they're not doing the right thing, they're not with the right people, they're not where they're supposed to be, and that is very distressing to us as social people. What can we do as a community? Well, I'm very happy to tell you that there are these movements happening all over the United States called Dementia Friendly America, Dementia Friends, um, Memory Cafes, where we're really trying to do systematic education programs to people that work in banks, to the mailman and mail lady, um, to um, people that work in department stores. We're trying to make the world more accessible and open to people who have dementia. These things are very, very important. My local hospital here in Pinehurst is starting an initiative soon called the Dementia Friendly Hospital. And that is so exciting to me because you need a formal program. Like I said, I believe many people have good intentions, they have very good hearts, but they need to be told what to do and they need to be empowered that that it's, it's human connection that we really need. Yes, there are skills. Yes, there are specific things you know within nursing that we should do. But really what matters is being sensitive to the unique needs of people with dementia and really, really connecting. That is the most important thing. So a dementia-friendly community, the definition is it incorporates the whole community, shops, uh, faith-based services, uh, the hospital, transportation, community leaders, and that we're all committed to working together to help people with dementia remain a part of the community and not be apart from it. Very simple, practical things can be done, okay? Um, how about people of faith? Okay, so there was this great quote that I found in my research um, that says, congregations must counter the stigma by telling a different story about dementia than the one that is told by secular culture. So the idea is let's not let people's faith be yet another thing they lose in the journey of dementia and let's help it be a safe haven for connection. We must counter the message of fear with a message of hope. We must counter the lie that the person with dementia is no longer with us that the truth is is that personhood and dignity and worth and God's love are with all of us all the time no matter what and it cannot be lost that God never forgets us even if we forget ourselves and our family so what's important to me in all spiritual faiths is intention what does your heart tell you to do and how can you match up your everyday behaviors, your values with your intention. So it's a great question to meditate on. Who are you called to serve? Who are you called to comfort? In the time of Jesus, he talked a lot about comforting the poor, the widows, the outcast. But I ask you now in today's society, who is a new group of people that have been forgotten, that are suffering right here in front of our faces, but so many times are not considered at all? 
I, I think absolutely it is people living with dementia. So the question is, is the church a place for leadership on this question? And I would say that it is. I'm very happy to tell you a lot of churches now offer dementia-friendly services, which is wonderful. Um, you know, we used to think about uh, lack of physical access to church. You know, are there too many steps? Is there not enough salt when it's icy outside? But now we're starting to think about cognitive access, and that is such an awesome thing. So this is a service where things are simplified, where uh, we get back to some old hymns. Amazing Grace is probably the most common song because so many of us know that it's emotionally moving for so many of us. Many times if people grew up in the culture of making the sign of the cross, people never forget how to do that. And even though these people don't remember the service, what we have in dementia is moments and we need more moments of connection. So what I ask you tonight after putting in 34 minutes of listening to me is to make four very simple commitments for how to be a friend to someone living with dementia. The first one is just to keep in touch with friends who may be going through the early stages of dementia, who may have been diagnosed, who are moving more into more and more impairment. Just keep in touch with them. That's it. Don't let those invitations go down. Don't stop visiting them, okay? Number two is to be more aware of the needs and offer assistance to people living with dementia in your community, okay? I will smile and say hello instead of avoiding somebody with dementia. Very simple. I will do an action that moves me closer to the person with dementia as opposed to ignoring and moving away. And the fourth one is I will start a conversation with someone with dementia. That conversation is not going to be the same as it will be with someone without dementia, okay? But that doesn't matter. Right? What matters is that this is a human being. This is not someone who is the living dead. This is not someone who's not still themselves. They are still themselves. It is a different version. It is a impaired version. It is someone who is having a lot of trouble with their brain and maybe controlling their behavior, but they still are a human being with very basic needs. And one of the most critical needs is this social connection. So please, doing your part to be more inclusive of people living with dementia is truly my heart's desire in doing these lectures for you. I know we talk about all sorts of different things and disorders and diagnoses, but at the end of the day, what matters most to me is trying to help the care of people with dementia be more progressive, be more human. I am going to talk about the connection on my next lecture between uh, brain injury and the development of Alzheimer's disease later in life. Someone uh, kindly emailed me this week and asked me that question, and I think if one person asks it, then there's probably a whole bunch of you out there who are curious. So I'll talk about that next Wednesday. If you thought this was helpful, if you found it to be inspiring, if you are in the world of dementia right now and no other people need to hear this, please help me spread the word by sharing it. I would really appreciate that. Okay, you guys have a great weekend and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.